Hi, good morning. Um, hope everyone is well today. Um, today, um, we're going to start our Busa PLC's Investor uh, Relations Series 3 with Ellen Tan Chiu Leong, um, Group Chief Economist from Afin Bank, Berhad. So perhaps we will allow a few uh, more minutes for all the participants to join. Before that, uh, we have a short poll. Um, can uh, Ferdaus help to project the poll on the screen? Okay, I hope everyone can see this. So economic um, data is something that uh, we always see in integrated reports, in results reports and all that. So I'm sure everyone here is quite familiar with um, integrating or incorporating some of this uh, data to kind of uh, give investors a feel of how your company is going to do um, uh, in the upcoming quarter or in the year even. So let's see. Um, do you think 2024 will be a better year for your company? And um, there's a tie between yes and unsure. Uh, let us uh, wait for a while to see um, what everyone is thinking for uh, how's the feel for next year like? So we have uh, 30 respondents so far, uh, 31. Um, I think um, we're leaning towards the more optimistic side of things um, with 47% of the respondents saying yes, 16% saying no, and 38% um, a bit unsure. And perhaps with uh, Ellen's presentation later on, perhaps we can have a better idea of how the macro and also the Malaysian economic uh, is heading. Um, so without further ado, uh, may I hand over to Alan for his presentation. Um, thank you, Alan. Thanks, uh, Musa, for having me uh, in this uh, morning presentation on the Macro Outlook 2024. Uh, I'll just share my slides. Okay, let me just start off by looking at some of the key economic indicators as well as the projection uh, made by institutional in, uh, agencies like uh, IMF, World Bank, and also Asian Development Bank. And when we look at the forecast make for the global economy, even though IMF is looking at a global growth be slightly below that of 2023, but when we look at individual countries like in the US, Japan, and even China, clearly we can see that the global growth environment remained very soft. But however, the anticipation or expectation going into 2024 is one where the global economy will likely avoid a global recession. Here, our expectation, similar to uh, what IMF, World Bank, and Asian Development Bank has been projecting, uh, we're expecting Malaysia economy to do relatively well next year as compared to 2023. As we all know, 2023 is a year where domestic demand continue to hold up to provide that cushion or support to the weakness in our export growth. But however, going into 2024, Assuming a scenario where the global economy continue to grow in the region of 3 or 3.5% 3 range, supported by US, China, and similarly the developing economies, uh, we think that looking at the official forecast of 4 to 5%, we think that Malaysia could come in at the midpoint of 4.5% next year. So uh, looking at the macro big picture scenario, uh, we, we believe that the economic environment going into next year 
a world be a better one. However, there are downside risks. When we look at the global manufacturing sector, as highlighted to you here in our presentation slides on the global PMI, back in August as well as September, China PMI was in the green zone. But in the latest month, in October 2023, we can see that the China global PMI has also dipped below the 50 level mark. So it's really in a contraction mode. And if you were to look at other major countries like the US, Eurozone, and similarly ASEAN region as a whole, uh, all these indicators point to what we call a weakness in global manufacturing sector. So again, back to my earlier uh, slides when, when we showed uh, the forecast made by international agencies like IMF, World Bank, uh, services sector has been strong, resilient, and this, I think, provided the support to the weakness in the global manufacturing sector. Even though when we look at the US pointing to 50 in the month of October, if we were to look at the official US ISM manufacturing, it is also you know, dipped below the 50 level mark. So it has not really uh, recovered as highlighted uh, in my earlier slides. But nevertheless, the services sector in the US continue to support the economy. And this has also been reflected in the US employment numbers, as well as the non-farm payrolls. And this, I think, uh, will continue to remain a supportive factor driving uh, the US economy going into 2024. Even though labor market getting tighter in the US, but we are also seeing some cooling down where unemployment rate is slowly creeping up, partly because of the very aggressive interest rate hikes uh, by the US Federal Reserve since early part of 2022, where the Fed has raised uh, the Fed funds rate by close to 525 basis points in the span of two years. And, and we know, you know, when central banks are so aggressive in terms of tightening monetary policy, uh, the tendency would be a sharp economic slowdown or possibly a recession. But like I mentioned, services sector in the US remain resilient, strong, and that I think has provided uh, some cushion to the slowdown in the manufacturing sector. As reflected in the US GDP, GDP numbers uh, continue to uh, you know, show strength, and this is really supported by the private consumption. As we all know, US today, uh, remain the uh, largest consumer market in the world. Uh, the US consumer continue buy from the Asian region, China, Malaysia, as well as the ASEAN region as a whole. So US remains the uh, world consumer market. And, and therefore, as long as the US economy continue to hold up, do well, uh, despite the aggressive monetary policy tightening, uh, we think that uh, global growth should avoid uh, a sharp economic slowdown going into 2024. But going forward in the upcoming uh, December FOMC meeting, uh, there are talks that the US Federal Reserve is closed or at the end of the monetary policy tightening cycle. Uh, the expectation here is that the US inflation has been trending lower uh, from a high of 8 to 9% uh, since middle of uh, last year. But nevertheless, I just wanted to point out this uh, key uh, points is that uh, the US Federal Reserve continue to target their inflation rate at 2%. And therefore, as long as the US inflation rate stays stubbornly high above the 2% target, there is this tendency or there is this uh, op possibility that the US Federal Reserve may hike policy rate further. But from our perspective, uh, looking at the current macro situation in the US, uh, we believe the US Federal Reserve is close or at the end of the tightening cycle. When we look at the forecast or projection, uh, I'm not an US expert, but I'm just uh, looking at the possible trend uh, of the US Federal Reserve. And we believe that in the upcoming FOMC meeting on 12, 13 December, the US Federal Reserve uh, will likely pause. 
at 5.25, 5.5. And they will likely keep the US Fed funds rate near this level, at least through to September. Some US economies are already expecting the first US rate cut to happen as early as June 2024. But as I guided earlier, with the Fed's targeting inflation at 2% and the statement made by the US Federal Reserve that they will hold Fed funds rate higher for longer, uh, we think that the US Fed would only make the first rate cut towards the fourth quarter of 2024. But however, I wouldn't be surprised if the US Fed decides to cut rate earlier. Partly, it's a preemptive move. Preemptive move to ensure that the US economy continue to sustain economic growth going into 2025. Assuming a scenario where if the 525 basis point hikes by the US Federal Reserve is managing a macroeconomic slowdown to bring inflation to a manageable level, then we think that high interest rate environment would eventually eat into consumer disposable income and also possibly slow down consumption spending as well as the economy as a whole. So therefore, to preempt the long high interest rates, uh, we think that normalization or uh, the easing of US tighter monetary policy may happen in the third or fourth quarter of next year. As we all know, since uh, early 2022, uh, major central banks, including Bank Negara Malaysia, we have uh, engaged or adopt a tightening in monetary policies. But however, you know, when we look at the situation going into 2024, where a scenario of uh, economic slowdown as well as uh, manageable inflation pressure, uh, we think that central banks, especially in this region, uh, would likely pause and no longer engage in tightening of monetary policies. And, and therefore, we think uh, Bank Indonesia, Bank Negara Malaysia uh, will likely hold rates, policy rates at the current level. In fact, our expectation is that uh, Bank Negara may likely hold uh, OPR at the current level of 3% throughout uh, 2024. And, and that, therefore, uh, we expect OPR to stay at 3%. The other point that I wanted to highlight is really uh, the situation in China. I know uh, there are many uh, uncertainties still, uh, especially in terms of uh, China economic growth. But when we look at forward-leading economic indicators, especially the OECD composite leading indicators for major economies, uh, even though uh, it remains relatively stable, but slightly below the 100 expansion mark. China is already showing some signs of recovery. And in fact, it has exceeded uh, the 100 expansion level uh, since uh, early or mid middle of uh, 2023. And if this pace continues to keep up, it, uh, it's basically signaling that uh, China economic growth uh, would continue to uh, remain well supported by domestic demand. And here we also hear that China authorities is coming up with stimulus, uh, government stimulus to pump prime uh, the China domestic demand, especially in terms of investment. And, and here we, we think that uh, as long as uh, China government continue to take a proactive stance in terms of sustaining uh, China economic growth, uh, that I think should lead to sustained uh, economic recovery rather than uh, you know, China heading into a sharp economic slowdown going into 2024. As we all know, Malaysia is a very open economy where our exports uh, sectors are quite diversified and, and therefore uh, even diversified in terms of the export markets. So with the recovery in China, uh, and, and similarly, with the advanced economies holding up, uh, we think that Malaysia exports will start to turn around uh, from the double-digit decline in the second quarter, third quarter. And in fact, in October, we are already seeing export growth in Malaysia 
contracting by only single digit, 4.5%, there, there, even though export growth may remain weak in the fourth quarter, but we expect a sharp turnaround or a moderate turnaround uh, towards the uh, first quarter of 2024. The other point to note on China, uh, re retail sales, domestic demand. Again, when you look at this uh, table, in July, most of the items in China retail sales were in the red zone. But as we proceed into the month of October, we can see that the turnaround from negative growth in China retail sales now turning slightly positive. So October month is important. However, we think that in the fourth quarter, uh, you know, retail sales uh, will likely uh, pick up further and, and therefore uh, support China domestic demand into next year. This is something that I think is important. As I highlighted to you, most regional economies, we are highly reliant on external trade, similarly Malaysia. But what is interesting going into 2024 is really looking at the global semiconductor sales. We know global semiconductor sales were very weak and recorded a double-digit decline uh, you know, in, in, in the month of uh, January 2023. But what we are seeing is really some recovery coming from the global semiconductor sales. And the other point that I wanted to note here is when we look at the projection by the World Semiconductor Trade, Semiconductor Industry Association, they are expecting global semiconductor sales numbers to turn around from negative 10.3% this year to a positive 11.8% on a year-on-year -year basis. Some may argue that this could be due to low base in 2023. But however, if we were to look at the breakdown in 2024 by product groups, we can see that the sharp turnaround is being reflected in the integrated circuits, the memory chips, especially in memory where the expectation is that we could see sales uh, turning around from a negative 35.2% in 2023 to 43.2% in 2024. I just wanted to spend some time explaining why the, the, the sharp turnaround. As we all know, uh, the start of the Russia-Ukraine uh, tension, there was some supply disruption. Commodity prices uh, shot up. And that, I think, also resulted in rising global inflation during that time. And from a manufacturing point of view, uh, there was some disruption uh, to the manufacturing uh, sector as well. And, and here, what I'm trying to illustrate to you is some global manufacturers may have used up inventories, yeah, US, US, use up inventories for demand. And now, when this normalization in supply chain disruption happens, uh, we may see global manufacturers, especially those in the tech sector, start to ramp up production to meet demand. And assuming if 2024 is a recovery year, a better prospect year for the global economy, including Malaysia, then the expectation is that manufact global manufacturers will start to ramp up production to also replenish some of the depleting inventories earlier. And that, I think, uh, was, we will see a combination of both uh, ramping up production to replenish inventory as well as to meet uh, overseas demand for integrated circuit related uh, type of uh, electronic products. And that, I, from, from my perspective, uh, would be a positive catalyst to drive uh, global growth, especially in terms of the exports of manufactured goods. And, and here uh, we look at the correlations between uh, world trade, external trade, as well as the manufacturing uh, sector and clearly the World Trade Organization is also expecting the manufacturing sector to turn around, uh, possibly recording a positive growth of 3.3% in 2024 as compared to 1.7% uh, forecast earlier. On the domestic front, 
from a macro perspective, like I mentioned to you, a uh, government is looking at 4% GDP growth in 2023, a range of 4 to 5% next year. We are looking at the recovery in exports and this will be also be complemented by sustained domestic demand to bring Malaysia's GDP growth at the midpoint of 4.5% in 2024, higher than the growth in 2023. When we look at the monthly export numbers, uh, even though uh, electronics remains in the negative territory, but we can see that the contraction, the sharp contraction is already showing smaller declines in the month of October. And, and therefore electronics accounts for close to 40% of Malaysia's total exports. And if going into 2024, our expectations for a global recovery uh, as reflected in the global semiconductor sales numbers, then Malaysia's exports of electronics would also turn positive uh, by the first quarter of 2024. And this will also be supported by other major uh, export products, uh, similarly to the electronics. And when we look at the major export markets uh, by countries, uh, clearly on a month-to-month -month basis, uh, some of the uh, countries are turning around to positive growth. And, and we think that, you know, especially in the U.S., if the U.S. economy sustained at the current level, uh, supported by domestic demand, then uh, we may see U.S. driving uh, Malaysia's export as well. Uh, on the imports front, uh, here I think uh, if you were to ask me which are the imports components that I track closely, uh, it would be imports of intermediate goods. Why? Uh, partly because it is really a proxy of future exports. And ag again, we are seeing the sharp double-digit declines is starting you know, earlier uh, this year has already narrowed to a single-digit decline. And if you were to look at the imports of intermediate goods in the month of October, turn around from negative 3.5% in September to 12.4%, in October, and that I think provides some indications that uh, you know the man manufacturer producers are also expecting some uh, improvement and therefore an increase in imports of intermediate goods. Let me just spend some time to look at uh, Malaysia's uh, quarterly numbers from the domestic, uh, you know, the domestic demand side, and here. Consumption, like I mentioned, continue to hold up very, very well. Private consumption uh, continue to add uh, to GDP growth in the range of 4.5 to 5%. Uh, what is interesting, I think, going into 2024 is the investment activity picking up. Like I mentioned to you, uh, global manufacturers, domestic manufacturers, or you know the MNCs especially, when we are facing a situation of global economic slowdown. The tendency is you will hold back, postpone on your investment plans. Even though the investment approval number looks good, but assuming a scenario where global economic situation remains uncertain, uh, a lot of the MNCs would hold back or postpone their investment plans. But what I'm trying to illustrate to you here is that with all this strong investment approvals numbers coming in uh, over the next, uh, you know, maybe few quarters, uh, we think that this would be realized, especially with the global economic outlook improving. So therefore, private investment activity is also expected to see a stronger pickup and that would help uh, support domestic demand in Malaysia. And we are also seeing the sharp turnaround in exports. Net exports will be contributing to GDP growth. And, and therefore, going into next year, 2024, we are seeing a more broad-based uh, recovery uh, as reflected in Malaysia's manufacturing sector, construction sector, and also uh, the services sector. When we move into 2024, I think I just wanted to highlight there are still multiple challenges uh, facing the domestic economy. And the government has recognized some of the challenges. 
In fact, uh, the release of the Madani Economy Framework, the National Industrial Master Plan, as well as the 12th midterm review, uh, government has identified what are some of the challenges that they need to address uh, in order to ensure that Malaysia uh, you know, can continue to prosper from here. Uh, we know that budget 2024 alone uh, will, will not be enough. The measures or the policies, the strategy announced in budget 2024 uh, will not be enough to cover for all the challenges that has been identified uh, under the Madani Economic Framework, Industrial Master Plan, or the, the 12th midterm review. But however, it is a positive start. The budget 2024, the implementation, the strategies uh, will help uh, in terms of uh, supporting the target set uh, under the 12th Malaysia plan. Here, when we look at the uh, breakdown, uh, this is really coming from a Ministry of Finance, uh, coinciding with the release of the budget uh, 2024 announcement. Uh, what we can illustrate to you is uh, the view taken is somewhat similar to what I mentioned two, three minutes ago, where domestic demand will see a turnaround and therefore, net external trade uh, riding on the recovery in global growth uh, should also turn around uh, here from a negative 6.2 net uh, export growth, negative 6.2 to a positive 4.1% in 2024. The other point that I wanted to highlight, and this is also something that will help uh, support uh, domestic demand going into next year. We know that in the budget announcement, government has allocated an additional 15 billion. Uh, this is under the midterm review of the 12th Malaysia plan, where the five years plan has been raised, or uh, the EE allocation has been raised from 400 billion to 415 billion and additional 15 billion. And we think that uh, majority of the 90 billion allocated for development expenditure will be spent. Uh, in 2024 and, and, and therefore uh, this will likely continue into 2025 and with the construction of uh, roads, hospitals, uh, schools, highways, uh, police stations and other infrastructure construction projects, uh, we think that will help create that economic multiplier uh, to support public investment and, and also the construction sector uh, in the country going into 2024. Labor market uh, remains steady uh, in Malaysia. Unemployment rate continue to hold up at very uh, good uh, level, uh, partly because we, we continue to see steady employment situation. And going from here under the 12th Malaysia plan, uh, when we look at the forecast uh, beyond 2024, going into 2025, uh, government is really looking at the strategies being implemented uh, driving Malaysia's economic growth towards the 5 to 6% uh, range uh, beyond 2024 going into 2025. And that, I think, uh, requires a combination of domestic demand, private consumption, private investment, as well as exports. And this is also something interesting. Uh, when we present our macro views to some of the foreign clients especially, foreign clients especially. Uh, fiscal deficit is one of the area of discussion where they, the foreign investors uh, has that tendency to ask you know, on the government's fiscal consolidation plan, government's fiscal uh, discipline towards uh, improving uh, the country's uh, fiscal deficit position. And if we were to look at the 12th Malaysia plan, uh, the target is really by end 2025, Malaysia's fiscal deficit position could reach the 3 to 3.5% of GDP. Uh, and, and this, I think, uh, should augur well for sentiment as well as uh, for foreign investors that have been concerned about Malaysia's uh, fiscal position. And there are a few initiatives uh, that the government, uh, as highlighted in the budget 2024, uh, would likely implement. And and, and we also see recently uh, economic minister talking about implementing the uh, uh, fuel subsidy uh, by second half of 2024. And, and therefore, uh, we, we think that that will also uh, help in terms of reducing uh, the expenses on 
uh, subsidy and you know with the government looking at ways to generate uh, revenue that i think would also help in terms of government's finances and, and therefore uh, looking at the government finances uh, as highlighted in the budget 2024 i think it is important to look at the revenue and the operating expenditure because since 1980s up to now malaysia has always been recording operating surplus what do I mean by operating surplus? It's really government's revenue enough to cover for operating expenditure, running a surplus. And the deficit that you know, the country experienced is really to finance gross development expenditure. This is investment for the future and, and therefore you know, the, the, the fiscal deficit. So it is important uh, to maintain the operating surplus uh, going from here into uh, 2025. When we look at the breakdown on uh, the operating expenditure, especially a uh, subsidy is expected to, to come down from 64.2 billion in 2023 to 52.8 billion in 2024. And when we look at the government's revenue, again, expectation is that government revenue uh, will come from direct taxation uh, like the company income tax, individual income tax, petroleum income tax. I think this is important. And therefore, also consistent with my narrative that if the government is supportive of economic growth, the collection from direct taxation would also keep pace with uh, the so-called economy or the revenue will also keep pace uh, with the performance of the economy. And, and we, as we all know, a direct taxation, corporate income tax, individual income tax fluctuates uh, with economic performance. So as long as the government is able to uh, you know, come up with initiative supportive of domestic demand going into next year, uh, the collection from direct taxation, I think, would remain pretty steady. And that, I think, uh, would also be uh, supported by con collection from indirect taxation. And that, I think, put some uh, less pressure, put less pressure on Petronas in terms of the, the, the dividend, the Petronas dividend to the government. I, I just want to move uh, my presentation now uh, to look at from a regional perspective, because here we talk a lot about macro fundamentals. When we look at macro fundamentals, we compare countries by countries and here, Malaysia stands out. When we look at the macro fundamentals, Malaysia stands out because Malaysia continue to run current account surplus. That is important, uh, despite uh, the deficit, the fiscal deficit. Uh, but government, uh, you know, is looking at adopting fiscal consolidation policy. Remain very committed uh, toward fiscal discipline, and that I think the the fiscal deficit position should improve. Uh, in the years ahead. And, and again, back to the economic fundamentals, uh, some countries in the region, they run twin deficits where they have current account uh, deficit as well as the fiscal uh, you know, deficit. Whereas Malaysia, sustain, good sustained economic growth, current account surplus, and consolidating fiscal position. So therefore, that should translate into a better ringgit from, from, from our perspective. But as we all know, uh, you know, Every time when we look at uh, you know, some of the news flows, uh, the focus is on the weakening of the ringgit. But we, we, we believe that the weakening of ringgit has to do with external factors, uh, partly because of the wide interest differential between uh, US rate and the regional interest rates, and as well as uh, the rising uh, geopolitical tension. And US dollar has maintained the so-called so uh, safe haven status. But however, what I'm trying to illustrate to you here is uh, despite the weakness in the ringgit uh, in 2023, uh, we expect ringgit to recover uh, towards the 440, 445 level uh, by end of uh, next year. Again, when we relate it back to the macro fundamentals, when we relate to uh, the current account surplus position, as well as looking at Malaysia's real effective exchange rate. Today, Malaysia's ringgit 
uh, remains weak as compared to regional currencies. But however, because of our strong macro fundamentals, that I think should lend uh, support uh, to uh, ringgit. And the other point to note here is, as I guided earlier, the US Federal Reserve is almost done, almost done with their tightening of US monetary policy. And, and there, therefore, uh, with the narrowing, of interest differential between the US rate and the local regional interest rates, we may see flows coming back to the region. We may also see flows coming back to Malaysia. And, and that, I think, uh, would help in terms of ringgit uh, performance uh, going into 2024. This is some illustration uh, just to show uh, the indicators on US dollar index remaining strong, uh, partly because of the Fed's uh, you know, hike in, in, in uh, interest rate. But I think this is the point that I wanted to highlight. When we look back to 2022 and the rise in US inflation, the root cause from my perspective is really the geopolitical tension. Russia, Ukraine, war started, rising commodity prices, leading to inflation pressure, especially in the advanced economy. And that's where the US Fed steps in aggressively to hike their policy rate to maintain the US inflation at the 2% target. Not just maintaining the US 2% target, but also to prevent the US inflation from rising significantly. And, and therefore, the steps taken by the US Federal Reserve to hike policy rate has managed to bring down inflation. So if you were to ask me what would be a risk factor uh, going into 2024, I would then relate it back to geopolitical tension, especially uh, you know, in, in, in Russia you, and, and Ukraine. Uh, because if assuming the geopolitical, geopolitical tension escalate, resulting in rising commodity prices, translating into higher US inflation, the US Federal Reserve then will be in a difficult position because from our perspective, then the 525 basis point hikes since early part of 2022 may not be enough to bring down the cost push inflation in the US. Therefore, uh, you know, the risk going into 2024 is is. Uh, really hinges on uh, the geopolitical tension. But from our perspective, looking at the macro situation today, uh, we, we think that commodity prices uh, should remain uh, relatively manageable uh, going into 2024, where we do not see an unexpected escalation in geopolitical tension. Lastly, I just also want to touch on uh, this very important point on sovereign rating. Uh, as you all know, Malaysia has maintained stable uh, outlook by Moody's, by SMP, but also by, Mid, by Fitch. And, and here, I think going forward, especially going into 2024, if Malaysia continue to remain very committed to fiscal consolidation and sticking to the fiscal discipline, uh, we may even see you know, some uh, uh, so-called sovereign rating agencies upgrading our outlook uh, from the current stable to positive. And that, I think, uh, should also provide uh, some positive uh, sentiment to not just uh, ringgit, but also to our market as well. Maybe I'll stop here. And if there's any questions that I can take, uh, I'll be more than happy uh, to, to take the question. Thank you so much, Alan, for the insights. And I'm very happy to hear that um, there are quite a number of uh, positive things to look out for in 2024. Um, so yeah, the um, floor is open for the participants to send in questions. Um, so before that, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, Alan, based on your view, are some of the major uh, events that we we can expect in 2024, how they may affect uh, some of these um, economic outlooks, such as uh, maybe the U.S. presidential election next year. 
do, do you have any um view on this or how this may affect um the US economy, which may ultimately uh, affect the global economy as well? Okay. Yeah, thanks. I think you brought up a very good point on the US presidential election, uh, which will be held in the US uh, in November next year. Uh, as you all know, uh, when President Biden reappointed uh, Jerome Powell as the US Federal Reserve Chairman, I think the policy then was to ensure that the US inflation remained uh, manageable and possibly stick to the forecast or projection target of 2%. And that is where uh, some complication, uh, you know, in terms of uh, monetary policy in the US going into 2024. Uh, like I mentioned to you, assuming a scenario where uh, the US inflation unexpectedly uh, pick up from the current uh, trend that we are seeing uh, improvement, because what we are saying earlier is that the 525 basis point hikes so far uh, would be enough to cool down U.S. economy and leading to slower U.S. inflation. But however, if uh, you know, geopolitical tension and unexpected uh, increase in rising uh, you know, commodity prices, the U.S. Feds may have to then take a more aggressive stance in terms of monetary policy tightening. That, I think, will renew the fear of uh, uncertainty in regards to uh, monetary policy tightening, whether or not the US Feds would continue to hike policy rates. So to answer your question, uh, it is important. Yeah, the inflation remains an important uh, topic uh, on the, for discussion uh, for you know the uh, Republicans as well as the Dem Democrats, uh, because in, as we all know, inflation eats into uh, US consumer spending, and not not only that. Uh, when we have a situation where if consumer in the US expect inflations to continue to creep up or to you know, increase in, with rising US inflationary pressure, uh, that, that I think uh, will, will also uh, disrupt uh, the consumer pattern uh, in, in, in the US. And, and similarly, uh, assuming a scenario where uh, if the U.S. consumer expect uh, the U.S. inflations to, you know, go into disinflation. Then uh, U.S. consumer may hold back on their purchases, uh, thinking that the prices uh, of consumer goods will, will start to come down, and, and that I think will also uh, disrupt the consum consumption pattern. So, from from our perspective, is uh, if we were just zooming in on the U.S. It is really uh, about the performance, the mandate of central bank in ensuring economic growth as well as inflation. So if inflation remains stubbornly high, then we know that going into the US presidential election, that would remain uh, one of the key topics that uh, re remain in their discussion. Mm, what about China? Um, since um, these are the two engines of the global economy, drivers. So um, do you think there will be any more changes other than those that you have uh, mentioned? Like what could be something that could alter the path uh, from the current uh, Chinese government's uh, policies to perhaps pump uh, prime and also to stimulate the growth? Okay, yeah. I think you raised a good point. Uh, today, we know, you know, after the entry of China into WTO, China has been, you know, a major force. Uh, in, the, in the global economy. And when we look at the recent IMF uh, projection uh, here, uh, IMS, I, IMF has revised slightly higher uh, China growth, indicating that uh, even though China today may still face some domestic issues surrounding the property sector, uh, surrounding the uh, state-owned enterprises, but the point that I wanted to highlight is really uh, the flexibility for China government to come up with stimulus. Because if we look at the government's, the Chinese government uh, finances, they can afford to come up with stimulus to support the domestic economy. So far, the policy has been through monetary policy where People's Bank of China 
uh, they have come out to uh, soften the monetary policy. And in fact, they are adopting an accommodative monetary policy to support uh, the China economy, especially the property sector. But however, if assuming going into 2024, the economy economic situation unexpectedly turned uh, for, for China economy or ch economic activity then. Uh, here, uh, what we are saying is that uh, China government will come up with new uh, stimulus plan. And, and therefore, uh, to answer your question, uh, even though there are issues facing China uh, economy today, uh, but we think that because of the flexibility of China government to come up with stimulus, that I think will help uh, provide the cushion uh, for uh, the, the, the economic slowdown. So we are not too worried uh, about China and not forgetting uh, the recovery in exports. Like I mentioned to you, global semiconductor sales are seeing signs of recovery. If you were to talk to some of the local tech companies in Malaysia, I can safely assume that they are also assuming some sort of recovery that they, may, they are already possibly seeing orders coming in uh, from China, from US, and that I think uh, should continue to support uh, Malaysia's export growth as well uh, going into next year. Uh, we have a question closer to home. Um, what's your take on the proposed fuel subsidy rationalization plan for the second half of 2024? Okay. Yeah, interesting question. And uh, like what the uh, Minister of Economy is saying, yes, uh, they'll likely go ahead uh, with the you know, plans once they have that PADU uh, database uh, ready. And, and, I, and since the guidance given here is that possibly uh, as early as the second half of 2024, then the government uh, would likely uh, relook at the current uh, price of RON95, especially RON95, because the uh, RON95, the domestic retail uh, price of RON95 has been kept artificially low at the current 2.05 per litre. And, and therefore, uh, from, from our perspective as well, uh, we think that uh, the domestic RON95 uh, will likely be adjusted higher. But we believe that any adjustment uh, to RON95 uh, may not be very aggressive. In, the, in fact, uh, we expect the government to take uh, the, a more gradual approach uh, towards uh, the fuel subsidy, uh, especially, you know, look, we're looking at the domestic demand situation, uh, looking at the possible uh, move on petrol subsidy on inflation, the country's inflation. So, so therefore, uh, from, from my perspective, is that any adjustment uh, in terms of the petrol uh, fuel subsidy scheme or mechanism uh, will likely be implemented or uh, you know, carried out on a more gradual basis. And this, I think, we, you know, should bring inflation to a manageable level. If we were to look at uh, government's official uh, CPI or, or inflation, a range, you know, for next year, uh, they are looking at a range of inflation rate at 2.1 to 3.6 percent. So, assuming if government were to go through uh, with the, uh, you know, raising the RON95 prices uh, higher gradually, uh, we think that inflation in the country uh, for 2024 could come in uh, at the upper end of the official forecast of 2.1 to 3.6 percent. Uh, but, however, it is also uh, really the uh, determined by the mechanism as well as the implementation of the petrol uh, subsidy plan uh, in, in second half of 2024. And, and why we are saying this? Because uh, again, when we look at the uh, inflation uh, basket or the inflation uh, you know, components uh, in the CPI basket, uh, RON95 do accounts for uh, a substantial weight uh, to the total CPI basket. So any adjustment to RON95 uh, would have some implications on headline inflation numbers. A and therefore, uh, best, uh, you know, any changes to the RON95 prices uh, should be done on a gradual basis. Thanks, Alan. Okay, we have another question. Um, do you see any credit risk? Uh, 
due to the bond defaults in China from the SOE and um, property developers. And also, um, what's the outlook with regards to the normalization of trade between China and US? So far, the actions of uh, US buyers moving away from China has benefited um, the ASEAN economies greatly. So uh, this is from Mary. Thanks for your question, Mary. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think the trade relationship between uh, US and, and China uh, remains very uncertain. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, earlier you asked me about the US uh, presidential election and, and, you know, what are some of the issues that they will discuss. I'm sure this is one of the hot topics, you know, uh, because a lot of tariff that was carried out uh, by the previous president uh, remains in place. And, and therefore, uh, as long as you have tariff in place, uh, in the trade tension between US and China will likely remain. And therefore, you know, when, when we look at this uh, objectively, when we look at this issue objectively, uh, the recent meeting between, uh, you know, uh, the two premiers, I think it's a really a, a early indication that uh, we may see more positive progress uh, going forward. Because if assuming if this US-China uh, trade tension continues, it will not benefit uh, China or you will not benefit the US. So the understanding is very clear that they need to come uh, you know, to a compromise and, and therefore uh, to really cool down on, on this uh, tension uh, between the two giants and at the benefits of their own economic progress. Because uh, today, if you continue to have tariff and, and uh, the trade friction, uh, then the policy of inward looking uh, will continue to derail uh, economic progress. What do I mean by inward looking? This is basically on protectionism because when countries start to look inward, yeah, that is where you don't see the continued trend of globalization, the positive trend of globalization. And that is where uh, that would put a drag on uh, not just the advancement of uh, the two countries, but also the advancement of the global economy as well. So from, from, from that perspective, uh, we think that, uh, you know, uh, discussion will continue. The trade tension, even though remains an uncertainty, but we don't think that uh, the US or China would engage again in further trade tensions uh, that resulted in, you know, some uh, so-called retaliation uh, between the two countries. That is not in our, our uh, you know, in our view or in our assessment of the global economy next year. What about any credit risks to the bond defaults from uh, SOE and also property developers? Yeah, this this is a continued concern. And, and, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, when, when we look at uh, sovereign rating agencies and how they evaluate a, a country risk rating, uh, it is also very important that they look beyond uh, you know, some of the issues that China is facing. They also look at the growth prospect. Yeah? They look at the uh, so-called uh, internal economy, whether or not the internal economy is big enough to generate that uh, economic growth, especially through domestic demand uh, to support uh, uh, you know, the, the sustainability of economic growth. Because after all, as long as the, a country can sustain economic growth, uh, they will continue to be able to have very good uh, current account surplus position as well as uh, the government's finances. And, and that, I think, uh, it provide uh, some stimulus of, or, or provide some flexibility uh, to tackle some of the issues uh, relating to the you know, state-owned enterprises or even the, the, on, the, on the property side. But uh, from, from that perspective, uh, even though uh, there, there could be some risk, but that should not uh, complicate the macro development uh, that, that we are you know, going into 2024. Um, also, um, regarding uh, Malaysia, especially Ringgit, um, on your, in your chart on, um, I think, slide 36, um, so far, Malaysian Ringgit has um, been uh, one of the 
underperformers in the ASEAN region. Um, given your view that uh, Malaysia is actually in a good position um, uh, with our economic uh, outlook, um, how do you think uh, the ringgit will fare uh, in comparison with our regional peers um, uh, going forward? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Market is forward-looking, yeah? Market is forward-looking in the sense that uh, from an from equity uh, perspective, uh, assuming if Malaysia's economy starts to improve uh, from second quarter, improve further from second quarter, uh, the tendency is, you know, market sentiment would also improve. We may see, uh, because of the narrowing in terms of interest differential, between uh, US rate and, and the local regional rates. Uh, and, and therefore, with Malaysia's, uh, like I mentioned just now, the fundamentals, we may see uh, foreign investors favoring uh, Malaysia more than uh, the regional countries. Because uh, here, the initiative, take, initiative taken uh, by the government in terms of uh, the Madani economy framework, industrial master plan, and, and also the midterm review of the 12 Malaysia plan, the strategies that the government uh, will adopt, I think this will lift uh, sentiments further uh, going into 2024. So to answer that question, will Ringgit outperform the regional currencies? If you were to look at my current projection where I see Ringgit at the region of 440, 445 against the dollar, then the, the, the implication here uh, would be, you know, ringgit would outperform. And, and therefore, uh, ringgit should see further signs of improvement uh, going into the second part of 2024. And the other point that I wanted to note is, uh, if assuming the current weakness in ringgit as well as the regional currency has to do with the widening interest rate differential between the US rate and the local rates, I'm, I'm just saying that there, 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 there are still downside risks because of the uncertain US inflation trends. Uh, if US inflation, because of strong domestic demand, labor market condition in the US, and inflation do the reverse and pick up, and the Fed tighten further, then my view on the ringgit may also uh, be different, right? But right now, uh, Today, in today's discussion, what we are saying is that we see the US Federal Reserve almost done or near the end of the US monetary policy tightening cycles. Regional central banks likely to hold rate at the current level. So the narrowing between the interest differential, I have mentioned this a few times, sorry for that. The narrowing of interest differential between local rates and the US rate would encourage capital inflows uh, back to the region and also to the, to, uh, the, the ringgit. And just to share, you know, uh, if assuming foreign investors, they are looking at better economy and therefore market uh, should uh, continue to show improvement. Uh, when I talk about the market, it's really about the, the BUSA, you know, uh, doing better. Then uh, with the view that ringgit would also start to show signs of improvement. Uh, foreign investors are really looking at uh, you know, the positive of the returns uh, from stock market returns as well as the ringgit returns. So it, in a way, it should provide uh, some catalyst uh, for a better market uh, next year. Hey, that sounds really good. <laughs> yeah, for investors uh, in the equity uh, space and also uh, overall um, Malaysia as a whole. Um, since you mentioned that uh, some of the events that could derail some of the outlook are geo mainly geopolitical events. Um, speaking of which, um, there's another one that's pa the Palestine and the Israel tension. Um, how do you think uh, if this part of the world could affect uh, the global economy outlook or maybe uh, towards uh, inflation because uh, sometimes uh, during this kind of geopolitical tension, uh, commodity prices such as uh, crude oil will be affected? Yeah. When, when we look at uh, geopolitical risk, yeah, implication is really uh, on the trade front. 
and like I mentioned to you, Malaysia, we are quite a highly open economy where our export markets are also uh, diversified. So uh, when we look at the, the impact uh, coming from uh, the uncertainty in the Middle East, that, that would uh, re really impact us through the trade channel. But then when we look at uh, our exports to that region, uh, it may not be as significant as compared to uh, the US and, and also you know, maybe uh, to the more advanced economy. But however, having said that, if the implication you know, or if the geopolitical tension escalate and it, it, it really impact the advanced economies, then uh, where, you know, the whole global economic situ situation may, may be uh, different from uh, what I've uh, guided uh, earlier. But having said all that, I think uh, while you rightly pointed out, geopolitical risk, uh, geopolitical tension remains a downside risk to global growth next year. But at the moment, uh, we, 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 we are uh, of the view that uh, we don't, we will like, unlikely see an escalation uh, uh, in, in, in geopolitical tension going into next year. Okay. Um, thank you everyone uh, for your uh, active participation and also to Ellen for answering all our questions and so also provide uh, very good insights into how uh, 2020 uh, sorry, 2024 have um, for us. Uh, sounds like uh, we do have a better year to look forward to. Um, so with that, thank you, Ellen, and um, for all the participants for your time um, with us today. We look forward to having you again in our coming events. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Busa. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.